we are very happy to have uh, professor devaruti chatterjee from ayuka and she will talk about some uh, neutron star astronomy so i will hand it over to her to start that thank you very much arpan and thanks to all those who are present even though it's a sunday afternoon um i will try to keep this talk as entertaining as possible so that uh, i mean your sunday is not ruined so let me share my screen all right just a second okay so you can see the screen right yeah. okay so um uh thanks to iit gandhinagar for inviting me to give this talk it's my uh, pleasure to be here today um so i'm debarati chatterji i am an associate professor at uh, ayuka inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics i'm also a key member of the ligo india project and also member of ligo scientific collaboration and ligo india scientific collaboration so today i'm going to talk about how uh, gravitational waves can act as a tool for probing extreme physics so um i will first outline what i mean by extreme physics so as um, just a second okay i think i'm still on yeah all right so um what i meant by uh, extreme physics is that we are looking into the building blocks of matter we are looking in, we are trying to look into the densest forms of matter in the universe so as uh, some of you might already know so this is the state of the art knowledge that we have uh from nuclear physics and particle physics uh so we have a standard model right so what does this model tell us it's that matter is made up of atoms again this is uh this can be broken down into nuclei and electrons and protons so the nuclei consists of neutrons and protons and uh again imagine looking into matter with an extremely powerful telescope so what do you see when you go um, further and further into the building blocks of matter ultimately you see that even these neutrons and protons are built up of constituent quarks so uh, we can say that the ultimate building blocks of matter are leptons on one hand so you can see these figures at the bottom leptons means electrons muons uh, tau particles etc and on the right hand side you can see quarks so there are six flavors of quarks and these compose all the matter that we see around us okay so how how can we probe this um as you can see that you need more and more powerful more and more energetic tools to look into a uh, matter to see what are the fundamental building blocks right so um first of all we can imagine nuclear experiments so nuclear experiments with nuclear experiments we can look into nuclei right um just a second can you mute yourself um arpan can you uh -huh. mute yeah can you mute the participants yeah thank you okay so um like i said so a uh, nuclear experiments give us a fairly good idea about um how uh, what nuclei are composed of okay so you can see this figure um again there is okay so let me try again so uh, if you can see this figure on the left hand side you see that this is the idea we have of the nuclear potential so what does it tell us it tells us that there is a short range repulsive core which means when you go very close at very close range then the uh, nuclear force has a repulsive nature and at longer distances it has an attractive nature 
So this behavior tells us that there is a certain saturation behavior of nuclei. And also we can determine binding energies of nuclei from nuclear experiments. So nuclear experiments give us, um, so what is the saturation energy per particle? What is the density and uh, also the binding energies and so on. There are also certain experiments which uh, help us to probe matter, which is not only, uh, so which is not at uh, um, neutron proton symmetric nature, which means that most of the nuclear experiments we have in the, in the laboratories, they have almost the same number of neutrons and protons. Whereas uh, there are, are some experiments which help us to probe what happens when you go to a very den very neutron rich matter. Okay, so you can see that there is an experiment uh, called isol trap experiment. You see this figure on the right hand side. You see that uh, these experiments actually probe uh, very, so this region, which is very far away from this beta stability line, which is the line where you have experiments at almost the same number of neutrons and protons, okay? And there are also these experiments like, uh, which are called uh, giant resonances or pygmy resonances. So what these do is they uh, probe into nuclear vibrations. So different kind of nuclear vibrations, which also tell us about um, so something called neutron skin thickness, which means uh, you look at the figure at the bottom, you see that uh, there are there is a difference between the say the RMS neutron radius and the proton radius. And therefore, this, this difference is called the neutron skin. So it's like a neutron skin surrounding the nucleus. So this can also be probed with some experiments. So all these tell us about the behavior of matter, which is not only at the same number of neutrons and protons, but also far away from it. So very neutron rich matter. What else, inf what other information can we have from terrestrial experiments? There are now these heavy ion collision experiments. You must have heard about CERN, uh, which is uh, the nuclear facility, the European nuclear facility at uh, the French uh, border, French-Swiss border. You might also have learned about some other experiments like Ganil facility, uh, which is in France and GSI in Darmstadt. Uh, so what happens in these experiments is that uh, beams of uh, heavy particles are made to collide and then these stream out particles and forming a core gluon plasma. And this is, hot and dense matter. So this is also some experiment which helps us to prove the nature of dense matter, okay? So these are all the different um, experiments that we can conduct on Earth to find out about the nature of, the extreme nature of dense matter. But what if I told you that there are also certain astrophysical um, sites, astrophysical objects, which can give us much more information about dense matter. So Exactly one of this kind of uh, object is called a neutron star or a pulsar. And this was um, a serendipitously discovered by Jocelyn Bell, who was a PhD student at Cambridge University. So in 1967, she had, she noticed some scribbles, uh, strange scribbles in her, in the radio frequencies that she was studying with her radio telescope while trying to observe quasars. So from this, uh, she noted that these were extremely periodic pulses that were arriving from outer space towards the Earth. So initially, people even thought that they, these might be uh, alien signals, but it was quickly understood that this is nothing but a pulsar, which means it's like a pulsating, it's a rotating compact star and giving out a strong electromagnetic beam along its axis. And every time this beam sweeps the earth, it gives out a pulse, okay? So these pulsars or compact stars are also uh, one of uh, like an astrophysical laboratory in space that can give us a lot of information about dense matter. How is that? So to understand this, we'll have to look at the origin of pulsars. So normal neutrons, normal stars, like say that of the sun, or it can also be say up to eight to 10 times that of the sun. So what happens there is that these, so 
light starts like the sun. So the sun keeps burning because it burns hydrogen fuel in its interior producing helium. And this balances the, this thermal pressure balances the gravity. And therefore this is a stable, um, stable object, right? So what happens in more massive stars, say like eight to 10 times as massive as the sun, this kind of fusion continues to produce heavier and heavier elements. So like hydrogen is burned to produce helium and then consequently carbon, oxygen, silicon and iron that you can see in the inset. But what happens is that now when, okay, I will play this uh, once again. So you see that this uh, is the cycle of such um, a star. And uh, so when these, when this fusion proceeds, it gives off energy, right? It gives off energy, thermal energy, which supports the star against gravitational collapse. But once these outer, um, once, um, Okay, so once uh, iron is formed in the core, what happens is that you can see here in the inset, so iron has the, um, the highest binding energy possible. And uh, therefore what happens is burning iron cannot produce any more energy. So here fusion stops and therefore what happens is the, there is a collapse of the outer layers forming, um, then ultimately nuclear energies are reached at the core and there is a bounce and throwing out these outer layers into space. This is something which is called a core collapse supernova explosion. You can see these beautiful pictures. If you go to the NASA web pages, you can see beautiful pictures of uh, supernova explosions like this. So this is the Crab Nebula and uh, the Crab, um, uh, so, uh, which is left behind after such an explosion. And so you can see here in the schematic figure. So this is this bounce and the outer layers being thrown out into outer space. And uh, what ultimately is left behind is the core. And this core is what forms a compact star or a neutron star. So um, if we look at the life cycle of a star, so this is exactly what I mentioned now. So a massive star uh, goes through these cycles where ultimately there is the supernova explosion and the core forms the neutron star. But like I said, so why are we studying neutron stars? Because neutron stars are actually the densest form of matter in the universe. So these are like astrophysical laboratories in space that uh, can 